My name's Hattie Wells and I'm an anthropologist in development work. But I'm also, I have been involved in Ibogaine therapy. In terms of the Ibogaine therapy work, my qualifications come from a background in addiction myself, so my own personal experience of addiction, and also um, lots of work in shamanism and shamanic counselling, and then a training in holotropic breath work um, and psychoth transpersonal psychotherapy, which never actually continued its course though, and then a foundation in herbalism and an interest in medicinal plants. Ibogaine, Ibogaine hydrochloride, is the isolated alkaloid from a plant called Tabernanthi iboga, which is from West Africa, and which is used there ritually by the pygmies. It has been for years and years, and is now used by a religious group. Fortuitously, in the 60s, a guy called Howard Lotsoff discovered that Ibogaine, um, this isolated psychoactive compound, is actually able to break addiction patterns. So he was a heroin user, took the Ibogaine, just recreationally, with eight other friends. And I think, I can't remember the exact numbers, but maybe six of them were heroin users, and four or five of them got clean after the experience. And he suddenly thought, wow, okay, we're onto something here. So he then took out a patent on it for all addiction. I think that was actually quite a bit later, that was in like 84. Um, and since then there's been kind of ongoing research, really mostly underground research though, so it's actually, there was a whole movement of junkies treating junkies with Ibogaine. But basically it's used for the, for the, um, for the treatment of addiction and breaking of habituation patterns. The thing that Ibogaine really stands out for is that it's able to eliminate withdrawal symptoms. Not, in fact, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to slightly change that. It's able to diminish withdrawal symptoms. So for some people it completely eliminates it, but for others it significantly decreases it so that the withdrawal is totally bearable. So people may enter a very short period of discomfort, but will have nothing like the usual levels of discomfort that a heroin user would have. But it's not just used for heroin, it's also used for all sorts of addictions because what actually happens when you take Ibogaine is that it... I mean, there's things kind of happening on a pharmacological level that I will explain if you want me to, but just on a personal psychological level, you have a very intense 24-hour period of introspection, which can be like a kind of life flashback, life playback, in which you see why you've made certain decisions and taken certain paths. And that enables you to really understand your addiction much better. It's been hailed as an, anti, as an addiction interrupter. Okay, that's the best way of putting it. Because it doesn't actually completely cure addiction, but it interrupts it to the extent that you've got a window of opportunity, basically, after you take Ibogaine. In my experience of administering it to people, people have about a three to four week period in which their cravings or or if it were heroin, their actual physical withdrawal symptoms are attenuated or eliminated. But also they have this kind of, yeah, period in which they feel free from the drug. Now, if you work with that, you've got a good chance of actually staying clean. If you don't, if you don't do any kind of aftercare program, chances are at the end of the month, the old feelings are going to kick back in and you may have had these incredible insights, but you may well use again. I documented all the people that I treated and I kept tabs on them for about 18 months post-treatment. And I wrote a report based on 20 case studies. And of those 20 case studies, I think we had a 40-45% success rate, which meant that people were clean 18 months later, which is considerably higher than anything else available at the moment. But obviously, you know, I, I took a break in the work after that, and it would be really interesting now to see, you know, five, six, seven years later, how those people are doing. And I really think that the people that were most successful were A, people who had obviously really come to a point in their life where they really were ready to quit, which is what any treatment program will say, but also the people that really were, ha had a really good support structure set up afterwards or had a rehab program to go into. You know, that the thing about Ibogaine is because it's a drug, it's very, it's a sort of very attractive option for most drug users. It's much more attractive than going into a rehab for six months. You go to take Ibogaine, you have a trip, and two days later or three days later you're cured of your addiction. And if you come in with that mentality and thinking this is just going to clear it like that, and you don't really have to do the work, it's actually not going to be much more successful than anything else available. If, you're, if you can really, you know, 
be prepared to work with what comes up in the experience, then you've really got a chance. And obviously, for some really hardcore heroin users, it is amazing to get over the withdrawal, which is part of the battle for them. They won't go into rehab because they can't face the pain of that. So in that respect, you know, at least even if they're only clean for a few months, at least they're clean. And generally what tends to happen is that if you've got, even if you get a few months, if you have a repeat treatment, you know, each treatment will be more successful. So you can have kind of six months later have another one and six months later have another one. So some people need two or three or four treatments. Um, you know, in the ideal scenario, you have your one experience, you have this life-changing kind of life playback and you're over your withdrawal and you don't need it anymore and then you have a lovely support structure to help you through the next phase but you know because it's not on the NHS and because it doesn't have the support so many people are treated in this kind of renegade fashion that they're not given the potential that they could have if there was a more sort of open ap attitude towards this type of therapy it's a uh, in the state of Ibogaine in Britain is that it's an it's, a, it's legal, but it's an unlicensed medication. And I work with a doctor. So, um, principally because there are some dangers of working with Ibogaine, but I think, I personally think that they, they, the treatment should be medically supervised. I think it's somewhat irresponsible for people to just, you know, do it in a room, on a, in a kind of... Which is what's happening. There's a lot of underground treatment providers that are former addicts that have now become you know, that maybe got clean from Ibogaine that are now treating other people and they shack up in a room somewhere, maybe in a hotel somewhere and give them the Ibogaine and then take them through the experience and then the person goes. But you see, if anything were to happen in that situation, if you're not medically trained, you're not really able to deal with it. Mm -hmm. Ibogaine in itself, I haven't really explained this, but it's, a, it's strongly psychoactive. So within half an hour to two hours of consuming it, you're flat on your back going through a very intense, um, or entering a kind of intense altered state of consciousness. So many people say it's very dreamlike. Um, it's not kind of delusional in the sense that you know who you are and you know where you are and you can get up, well, you, you can't actually really get up, but you can, you can place yourself. Um, but it's physically incapacitating, so you get what's called a taxi, you can't, you can't really move and where your, your sense of your spatial awareness is seriously distorted so if you tried to put your foot on the floor you're gonna not hit the right spot basically and because of that and because of the psychoactive nature of it it's quite it's considered quite a radical treatment and quite difficult to contain and you know national health services certainly aren't used to administering anything like that and no one's really behind you know, the, the potential kind of therapeutic use of psychoactive drugs, psychedelic drugs, I should say, because there's lots of psychoactive licensed drugs, but anything mind-altering in that way that you might consider a trip, so to speak, people just are unwilling to get behind. Plus, there are, you know, there are some sort of dangers with it. I don't actually think nearly as many dangers as, as with most licensed medications, but there are potential problems um, with people with heart problems or liver problems. You couldn't really take it for fun. In low doses it's a stimulant, but in high doses it's so incapacitating and it's such an intense experience, you, you certainly, you wouldn't be taking it for fun. It's kind of like a, a wake, you know, it's really a wake-up call and if there's anything in your life that you don't want to look at, it's going to show it to you. Which is generally not the kind of thing that people do for fun. It's not used regularly. In, in Africa it's used, um, it's used as their sacrament. So much like we would go to church and, you know, partake of the, what do you call it? Communion. Partake of communion. Um, they will go to church and eat iboga root. Now, they'll do that, they'll do that and they'll eat small amounts, which are stimulating doses. But when they go through their rite of passage, they'll eat a large dose which actually takes them to the point of death, they call it the small death. And in that, you'll have a mother and father within the ritual and they'll take you through the whole sort of three to five day process and stay with you throughout that. But that only happens once in your life or twice if you're gonna become a, a priest in this sort of area. Religion that uses it now is called the Bwiti. 
and they're sort of scattered across those three countries and they will use it differently in each country so sometimes the rite of passage may be 16 or 17 sometimes it might be 23 or sometimes it's a it's a kind of um it's somebody that finds the religion at 30 and your entrance into that religion will happen at whatever point you do that i'm now working with a doctor so he's the prime caregiver i'm the assistant um he would have someone would come for whatever kind of addiction and in fact it's not necessarily just for addiction lots of people do it for just self-development and therapeutic reasons so some people come for tobacco addiction or cannabis addiction but that's really sort of a substitute for I want to go deeper and understand why I'm using these substances or or even just I want the experience so how the treatment progresses would depend on why you're coming for it so, but let's, let's take a heroin user because it's the kind of easiest way of describing it. You'd have a pre-session consultation with the doctor who's also a trained psychiatrist. We would, have, we would monitor, we would get an ECG done, a heart reading done, a liver function test done because they're the two things you have to watch out for for your health in terms of consuming this substance. Um, we'd do a full kind of health blood profile, health check, psychiatric evaluation and then um, explain what Ibogaine is, how it works, does the person feel comfortable having this kind of treatment, um, are we comfortable working with each other, that kind of thing. And then if they go ahead, then you have you, you book in your session, you come for your session, you might arrive at 10 a.m. in the morning, you'd be administered a test dose, um, which is a small amount just to see that there's no allergic reaction. Then we would sit and chat and kind of make the person feel comfortable for the next few hours. And then two to three hours later, be given a full dose of the Ibogaine. At which point, we then sit with them for the next 24 hour duration, continuously monitoring their vital signs and making sure they're comfortable and uh, making sure that they've got everything that they need. But that person will then go I, I, you know, go into the experience within half an hour or two hours. At that point, they won't be able to really communicate at all. They won't be able to move. Um, and they'll kind of sink into themselves. And then what tends to happen is you'll get vivid memory recall. So experiences will kind of flash before your eyes and sort of, it's sort of like, a, it's sort of like a dream. Dream, stroke between kind of, yeah, but, but very visual images coming across and they'll tend to be from your past and pertinent experiences and um, or they can be very otherworldly. I mean, you can get spirits wandering through the room or your ancestors wanting to come and tell you something or actually you, you know, what happened with me when I took it is I actually hallucinated, you know, 3D objects in the room just appeared out of nowhere that were as real as you are sitting now. So it can be very kind of abstract in that way, but then interspersed with very personal material, much like your dreams are. That'll then run for kind of 12 to 24 hours, depending on the dose, depending on the person's cons um, constitution. And let's say at about sort of 16 hours, the person will probably start communicating and um, and may then experience some physical discomfort, which can which are mostly the result of the ibogaine. You'll you'll experience kind of fatigue and um, you may experience some nausea. People may experience some nausea at the beginning of the experience as well, um, and some kind of discomfort in your body but that's also just from lying down for so long in that kind of position and then within 24 hours you're pretty much unless you've been given a, a big dose because of your habit um, you're pretty much coming back to normal and definitely able to engage and communicate and then there's a sort of post treatment therapy session and then you'll go home and then there'll be regular contact afterwards to see how you're going for the next few weeks. Now you said you took it, why did you take it? Um, I took it primarily because I thought that if I was going to help other people go through this I needed to experience it, I needed to experience it myself, but also 
because I was smoking tobacco and I wanted to quit I wanted to quit tobacco use um, and I also just for the experience you know so did it help you quit tobacco it did I quit for I think nine months that time <laughs> uh, <laughs> So, yeah, I quit for nine months, maybe a year, um, and then started again. But I definitely had that feeling. This is what people say. You come out of the experience, and you may want a cigarette, but you know that you're not dependent on it anymore. You're not really, like, it's, you have the choice again. So you may still want your drug of choice, but you don't need it in the same way.